My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together, the faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. The 2024 national elections kicked off right here in New York, where Democratic former Congressman Tom Swasey reclaimed his old seat in the special election made necessary when Republican George Santos, a bizarre fraudster, was kicked out of the House of Representatives by the Republican majority. Swazi's win flipped the seat and gave Democrats a big boost as they try to reverse the razor-thin Republican majority, even as Democrats are on the defensive, trying to hold on to their even narrower majority in the U.S. Senate. All of the pundits, and speaking as a former pundit, are mining Swazi's win for messages about how this year's campaign will proceed <coughs> as we're facing a likely rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Is politics being nationalized, as many, as, as many pundits suspect, or does the old dictum by the late House Speaker Tip O'Neill that all politics is local still apply? We're here to assess the lay of the land, including what's at stake for CUNY students and all young voters, voters who, while, who, while traditionally among the lowest turnout cohort, are showing signs of being activated in numbers that we have not seen before. Steve Romaleski is the, is the director of CUNY's mapping service at the, at, the, at the Center for Urban Research, a timely panelist as the state legislature has just, turned, just changed congressional district lines for the third time in two years that could affect outcomes. Uh, Nayela Amaro is a political activist and democratic strategist and a PhD student at the CUNY Graduate Center who has been in the trenches working with young voters here and across the country. Basil Smichael is the director of public policy programs at Hunter College's Roosevelt House, a former director of the state Democratic Party, and a regular commentator on MSNBC, which I guess makes you a pundit too. <laughs> and Jeff Colton is a political reporter for Politico and co-author of the Daily Politico Playbook, who will tell us what it all means. <clears throat> Steve, you're the mapping guru. Let me start, let me start with you. As we're taping, this is right after the uh, Democratic, legisl the Democratic legislators in, in, in Albany drew up new maps, not that different from what the Independent Commission did, but it looks like these maps hurt an upstate Republican congressman who nobody even in the Republican Party likes, um, and, but doesn't make any really profound changes. Why did this happen? How did this all play out? Well, I could go into a lot of detail about the sordid history of how it came to be now, but I guess the one thing to remember is that redistricting is not destiny. Um, the legislature or whoever is in charge of redistricting, whether it's an independent commission, how it might change in the future, we don't know, has to draw new lines after every decennial census because the population has changed and the the population of each district basically has to be the same to preserve the one person, one vote principle, population equality. And so the congressional lines are redrawn, the state senate and state assembly lines are redrawn, as well as New York City Council and other local. And um, so there was uh, a new process this time around <clears throat> that didn't quite work out. Um, there was uh, one lawsuit that was brought predominantly by Republican plaintiffs that forced the lines, the, the legislative lines for Congress to be redrawn because they were deemed unconstitutional. This was for the 2022 elections. Right. <clears throat> and then another lawsuit was brought by predominantly Democratic plaintiffs that forced the lines to be redrawn again. And uh, the Independent Redistricting Commission stepped in and, and drew the lines. The legislature said, no, we're going to draw our own lines. But they didn't really make right. changes much. Um, and, but, you know, it's hard to say there's a lot of speculation about what this will mean for the control of the House of, Republic the House of Representatives and, um, you know, which seats will flip. It depends so much. I'm um, very much of the politics as local uh, or through that lens uh, perspective because it depends on candidates. The third district is a great example. So the lines were redrawn <clears throat> and uh, Biden would have won that district. And George Santos won that district. And then just shortly thereafter, Tom Suozzi wins the same district. <laughs> so it's no guarantee that simply by drawing the lines that will ensure that, a, you know, it'll go red or blue. That's, a, um, you know, the, the, uh, the ultimate argument over, over redistricting is should politicians pick their voters or voters pick their politicians. And, um, but what happened in 2022 in New York we elected, we went far to the right in terms of Republicans 
taking seats that were that were democratic held while the rest of the country produced pretty much of a democratic wave mm -hmm. and you know I believe that we're obsessed because we're junkies we're we're obsessed with things like redistricting but Swazi's messaging was very mainstream you know Swazi ran a campaign attuned to a district that had rejected Democrats, you know, you know, uh, Democratic voters. What do you learn from from that? Well, you know, for a long time uh, in New York, we always thought our Republicans were different than the rest of the country. That is no longer the case. George Pataki is not walking through that door uh, anytime soon. And you know, the thing Touché. about Tom Swazi and I, and I worked with Tom Swazi back in 2006 when he was trying to be governor. That was, I think, four governors ago, uh, or three governors ago. Um, you know, he he always represented very well, and he was the former mayor of Glencove, if I remember correctly, and represented the suburb, that suburb, very, very well. Um, and the county executive. And and, right. and, and and then county executive. And then so what we what what I think has been interesting, number one, is that Democrats had done well in the suburbs, and we've done better we sort of outperformed and and that you know was really helpful in 2022 but when when tom swazi runs for governor he runs to the right of kathy hochul um particularly, kathy hochul on, this, particular, particularly on this issue of of crime mm. something that as a democrat i uh was concerned that we weren't pulling back on that narrative we weren't taking over that narrative sort of seeded that uh, to Republicans, it, partly bail reform, but not not entirely. It was there were a lot of other issues that were at play here that that I think Democrats ceded to Republicans on. Um, and Swazi sort of took that and understood exactly where he was and where he was coming from, and ran the campaign that he did ultimately losing. But quite frankly, that set the stage for how he would run in this special election. Um, to the right, I guess, of even Joe Biden, um, and mm -hmm. and went went after him, attacked him, and I think voters in that district really wanted to see that. Again, I do feel that Republicans were successful at taking the migrant issue away from Democrats, taking the narrative of crime away from Democrats, racializing and urbanizing that issue, um, because I don't know that there's high crime in Glen Cove right now, uh, but they he, they were very good at sort of co-opting that. He seized on that, ran locally in the ways that he had to, again, in the ways that I said, um, but also uh, did, the, did one thing that Democrats have found success on, and that is attaching the most draconian reproductive rights policies to Republicans, right? And by doing that, really balancing the local and the national, you know, I think he was successful. And I do think in, in many ways it's a model for uh, Democrats running in those types of districts. Layla, um we also are uh, taping this right after the Michigan primary, where you saw a significant, in the, on the Democratic side, you saw a significant people going for, for uncommitted, which was one of the options. And that is interpreted, I think, correctly. There's a huge Arab-American population in, in Michigan and great concern over the Israel-Hamas Israel war. But also you've seen these kinds of uh, progressive mainstream, for want of a better thing, fights within the Democratic Party, Bernie's, you know, Bernie Sanders' various campaigns. And, you know, one of the things we've talked about this beforehand is there's, you know, a move to boycott the election. How do you motivate? Are young people more, and, but yet young people are turning out in greater numbers than they used to. How do you, how do you assess that? Absolutely. I think it's important to hold space and acknowledge, um, one, um, young voters, voters in general, but particularly young voters, um, have the right to be frustrated with the way the current system operates, right? It's incredibly cumbersome. We all were at that Ab age. Absolutely. Who amongst us has not been frustrated with the political process at some point? Um, and I think just to, to recognize that, right? And also within that same breath, also have honest conversations with ourselves and say who is in a position of privilege to say I choose not to engage in policies and systems and practices that have disparate impacts, maybe not on me directly, but on the folks that I proclaim to want to uh, protect and to 
have policies to support and, and, and protect. Um, with that said, you know, younger voters generally tend to be more drawn towards issues more so than specific candidates or parties. And I think that is something that um, both parties, speaking through a partisan lens, really need to be intentional about rethinking how they engage younger voters, um, not just the first time voter, right, but also to make sure that they keep coming back and again and again. And that way you do have a committed Democrat voter and not just a first time voter or not a, a voter who comes up, you know, and votes every four years for a presidential, but does engage in the local municipal um, uh, elections, which I would argue um, all politics is local and has um, just as much, if not a more uh, direct impact on the younger voters in, in particular. This question of, uh, you know, one of the great organizing, uh, Jeff, one of the great organizing principles for the Democratic Party is somebody named Donald Trump who is, uh, from a purely political motivating perspective, is a, is a great motivator. And, you know, mm -hmm. I don't particularly think he believes anything that he's saying in terms of, uh, you know, reproductive freedom, in terms of, uh, you know, all the kind of right-wing stuff that he's, all the Christian nationalist uh, stuff that he's playing with. Assess this in terms of, you know... I think our Republicans used to be, you know, John Lindsay Republicans, George Pataki Republicans, but they're not. So, I mean, give me the lay of the land. There's a fascinating situation going on right now in the Republican primary for U.S. Senate. So, Kirsten Gillibrand, Democrat, currently the senator, the Republicans are looking to uh, bring a candidate forth to run against her. The Republican Party overwhelmingly nominated this guy, Mike Sapriconi. He's a retired NYPD detective. And he's probably one of those guys you'd consider to be an old school New York Republican. Uh, he has uh, criticized Trump before. He's said the basic line of something like, uh, you know, nobody is above the law. Uh, and he is a businessman. He owns a security business. He's donated primarily to Republicans, hundreds of thousands of dollars to Republicans, but he's donated a little bit to Democrats, too. Now, that's the guy they nominated. There is an all out like assault against him within the Republican Party now, saying this guy is not Trump enough. They're saying this guy, he donated to Letitia James, the attorney general who's, you know, prosecuting Trump. And in return, Sapriconi, the Republican nominee, is completely embracing Trump. He tweeted a, pic, uh, a picture of, of the president saying, I love this guy. We got to get behind him. He uh, gave reporters like myself a quote saying, you know, I went to a Mets game once with Trump and we shared a hot dog just to show his affinity for Trump. So, yes, basically the Republican Party, even in New York, if they try to nominate somebody who has a little more mainstream appeal, maybe a little uh, hesitant about Trump, uh, the base of the party has responded and said, no, no, we demand full loyalty for and we have, Trump. And we have closed primaries. So we don't, you know, it's not like South Carolina or New Hampshire where independents can vote in the Democratic primary. Exactly. It's only Republicans that are going to vote in this June primary. And uh, because it's a closed primary, it's, it's generally the more motivated, more loyal Republicans that are voting. So to get through a primary, to even get to run against Kirsten Gillibrand in, in December, or in November, excuse me, uh, he has to get through the primary. So, yes, he's, he's running to the right. He's embracing the MAGA Trump side of things. And it, I think it really just speaks to this, this, uh, this issue that you're talking about of, of whether the Republican Party can differentiate itself from Trump. And, and, and just briefly, I think we saw that in the Swazi race, too, that, that, that Basil was speaking about. Uh, I think that the, that the Swazi team did a good job of attaching Pillip to the more extreme elements of the Republican Party. Particularly on reproductive yeah. Exactly. Issues. Whereas Swazi did a very good job of uh, producing or showing himself as a moderate. And he has that record. He has those those connections. And I think uh, there were a lot of folks that said, I just want the more moderate candidate. Mm -hmm. And he was the obvious choice in that case. You know, one of the things in, in districting, I read, you know, I read this, what is it, the Center for American Politics, which uses some of your data analysis in deciding whether a district is a toss-up, it leans, it's solidly for one party or another. Um, and one of the things that you look at is what happened in the presidential election within those census tracts that make up the particular district. Is that predictive? <laughs> What's the financial dictum that past performance is no guarantee of yes. future? <laughs> uh, you know, it is really hard to tell. I mean, there are kind of general patterns. And actually, it's interesting talking about how the 
there's the presidential turnout in New York City, I'm talking about anyway, and then for the other elections, for state office or for local council, the turnout drops tremendously. And it's interesting because the, you're probably much more impacted as a New Yorker by your council member yes. mm -hmm. than the policies they enact or by the state legislature. Uh, than president. I mean, obviously, everyone's imp impacted by the president of the national policies, but uh, but turnout is much lower um, for these local elections. So that's a general pattern, um, and there are substantial pockets of the city that tend to vote Republican or Democrat. But th it, it's increasing no pockets to voting Republican, actually. Yeah, but it goes back and it's cyclical, mm -hmm. and it, it is it's so dependent on candidates and on the issues of the day. Uh, so it's hard to say. You know, I was looking at some of the maps that we've made going back over the mayoral elections. And when you look at the patterns of votes for Republican mayor candidate or Democrat, they're generally the same across the five boroughs, but there are key differences. We've had Republican mayors, and we've had pretty strong Democrats run against those Republican mayors. Like in 2009, when Bill Thompson ran against Mayor Bloomberg, Thompson did generally well in typical areas where Democrats at that level, executive level races, do well. I think Bloomberg but, was, he had been a Democrat, then he was a Republican. I think he may have been an independent at that point before he became a Democrat again, but that's just for accuracy. Bill Thompson was the Democratic candidate, yeah. and he lost. And even though he did okay percentage-wise in those areas, Southeast Queens, Central Brooklyn, South Brooklyn, large area of the Bronx, uh, you know, Manhattan's t relatively liberal upper west and east sides, um, it, the turnout wasn't anywhere near enough. Yeah, but... Uh, and, and then a year later, Obama did great in those areas. But, you know, uh, you know, looking at that, because we're, you know, again, have no lives and look at this stuff, um, Billy Thompson did very well in the, the best of the three runs because it was the third run and because people were punishing Bloomberg for having pulled the shenanigans he did to be able to run for, for, a, for a third term. I, you know, I'm not sure, absent that, it, I mean, um, you look at this stuff. Well, also, for full disclosure, I worked on that Bloomberg <laughs> campaign. Okay. Um, the the, the but he third was, controversial but he one. Was, but uh, he was punished because... Well, he, he, third terms are always hard. Won. Third terms are always hard, right? Also, it helps uh, to have $100 million to well, drop on the campaign. Third, third terms are ha always hard. How he got the third term was obviously very controversial, but third terms are always hard. Yes. Ed Koch, uh, Mario Cuomo, all, even George Pataki, all very difficult uh, because voters just get tired of you. Uh, as good as a job as you might do, voters just get tired of you and want to go in a different direction. Um, but yeah, I think I think the margin was like three or four points. Yes, I think. More. And uh, so it was, it was very close. Um, yes, the hundred and two million or whatever it was that he, uh, Bloomberg ultimately spent. Uh, Rich or did, poor, did, it's did good matter. to have money. That's what my ninth. But social but I but I would always argue that message comes before money because there are plenty of rich people in this country that have run and lost because they just didn't have that appeal. And I think, and it's interesting because fast forward, I worked on another campaign from here in 2021. Um, and all of the polling said that New Yorkers still kind of liked Mike Bloomberg, that they just liked a manager. And that's why I often say that New York is not ideological. I think we're six to one Democrat to Republican, whatever the number is, maybe seven to one now. But New York is its own ideology. Voters just want someone who is for New York. And it was amazing how, as, as de Blasio's ending, that voters are, so, and maybe there are a lot of other reasons for this, but there are a lot of voters that just liked Mike Bloomberg's management style. You know, uh, Nayella, there ain't no way in hell a Republican's going to carry the, the presidential election in New York this fall. Um, you know, we are, you know, we're a bank account, you know, where people, you know, candidates come to raise money. Mm -hmm. But if you got to worry about New York, the election is over. So, um, uh, and I think that, I think Basil's touching on something that, you know, we're, we're less ideological, but young people tend to be more ideological. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's, there's an inherent conflict. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, you know, and I think that's what Biden's experiencing with the, Michigan vote, and you know a lot of it around. It's not only around 
the um, Israel-Hamas war. I think it's broader. I think that, and I think we saw it play out in, again in the Bernie Sanders. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. looking to you as the young, as the young person <laughs> representative on this panel. Absolutely. It's a fair point. Listen, I think that um, as we go through our journey as voters um, and as our position in life you know, transitions and evolves, um, sometimes our ideologies do and sometimes our priorities oh, in where they sit within those ideologies do, right? <laughs> Um, and so I think I think it's a fair point. I think that the, the, the younger voters are really drawn towards big structural reform to address all the things that plague society, which is a lot, right? But government um, does not work that way. Government focuses on incremental change, taking consideration a lot of different political variables of what can be done within the political calendar, within the political landscape, with the candidates and incumbents that we have. Um, all these different you know, uh, considerations lead to progressive policy reform, but maybe not as progressive um, or as drastic as younger voters would like. And it is a point of tension, right, when you're talking about how do you secure and build a base of youth voters who so deeply are yearning for structural change, but yet the systems that we work within and live in under as citizens and as engaged citizens at that, um, are, are, are working with very different types of structures that do not give um, credence to big structural reform all at once or all the time. You know, we've, you know, we've been watching this with the DSA candidates who can win in smaller legislative districts, um, frankly, in, in districts with a lot of younger people, a lot of those are white younger voters. And, uh, but when they get into a, a Bronx congressional district that's now represented by Richie Torres, for instance, come in sixth. <laughs> and um, so it's, uh, you know, there is a certain luxury of being young. I was once young. <laughs> um, so uh, this tension is, you know, is bedeviling Democrats. It frankly bedevils Republicans, but it's not an age thing. It's so much of a never, you know, the never Trumpers are not so much an age-based thing. It's, you know, and it's not even so much ideology as it is just being appalled at, uh, at, his, you know, at his behavior. But I believe we have seen younger people also uh, grow in their affinity for Trump. I believe I've seen that polling. Still, like, very, very more supportive mm -hmm. of Biden than Trump. But over time, there's been a shift among a lot of demographic groups, including young people, uh, towards Trump, which uh, I, some, I mean, I guess that there are reasons for it, but it, it is, it is uh, frankly, a little surprising uh, to me. But I, I think that it is part of the uh, him being out of power and uh, supporting Trump being coded as uh, revolutionary in a way, uh, as being anti-establishment. Well, there's also an argument that, that. <laughs> that, you know, there's a revolutionary argument that you, if you make things as bad as possible, you're going to be bringing about the revolution. You know, I mean, I'm a child of the 1960s. And, um, you know, I went to one SDS meeting, but they wouldn't let you whisper in the back of the room. So I figured this was really not, this was, this was a really not for me. And I'll say, as a, as a counter, by the way, to the, I mean, yes, it's true that there was a DSA candidate who uh, lost against Richie Torres in the South Bronx district. The rest of the Bronx is represented by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Jamal Bowman, uh, who are both, uh, Bowman was DSA affiliated, uh, AOC currently is, and then Adriano Espeyad also has a section of the Bronx, uh, and he has one of the most progressive voting records in the entire Congress. Uh, so, you know, that, that is true in some cases, but uh, I think DSA does have to get a lot of credit as an electoral force. And part of that force electorally is not just appealing to people that agree with them ideologically, mm -hmm. but also their candidates being, in many cases, very strong on messaging about the more day-to-day -day issues, the things that are less ideological. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of those uh, winning candidates have done a good job, and even people that are conservative will still vote for a DSA candidate in some cases, mm -hmm. like AOC. We've seen a lot of support in that way. AOC is a phenomenon. She's um, one of the most skilled. Would you want to jump in, or? Well, I was going to say, you know, one thing also about <clears throat> um, how New York's voting system works, you mentioned that we have closed primaries. And so most voters are registered as Democrats in this city, and there is a good chunk registered as Republican, but a greater number are mm -hmm. registered without any party. You don't mm -hmm. you, you yeah. check off the box, you're considered a blank. Right. Mm -hmm. And you, they can't vote. 
in the, in the primaries. Where so, elections are essentially, right. resolved, essentially resolved. Right, right. So you have, you know, like in uh, these challenges in, uh, in the Bronx where there's a big primary election, it's a very uh, a limited pool of people that are going to be voting in that. And if you're independent, especially if you're young and you don't want to get involved in the parties, you, you don't check off that box, you're, stu you're, you're shut out of the picture. Mm -hmm. um, these kinds of... Uh these kinds of tensions, this kind of messaging beyond the party, mm -hmm. you know, you know that she's talking about this great institutional change. You know, I mean, we were, we were very impatient, and um, you know, an argument that makes total sense to me now that uh, because there's incremental change, will bring people. You know, the, the you know the moral arc of the universe moves it's towards serious. justice, yeah. but it's slow. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to argue in my mind, that taking my marbles and going home and not participating is going to do anything to help the kind of people you say you want to help. Well, I have a lot of students that say they're not going to vote, but there, there are a lot of adults that say they're not going to vote because <laughs> they don't like their choices. I think to your point, um, I've argued that this is going to be more of like a, akin to a parliamentary election because nobody like, it seems like more and more people don't like Donald Trump or Joe Biden. So my thing is, Vote, look at the agendas. Just If you don't like the individuals at the top of the ticket, just compare the agenda, right? Um, I'm voting for the, the party that's going to increase my ability to vote, not decrease it. I'm going to vote for the party that's going to increase <clears throat> the opportunity for women of color to have better health care and be able to secure their reproductive rights. So I think from that point of view, uh, that's the argument that I've been making. But there are a lot of folks that say they still don't want to participate. And look, I was young once as we all were. Apartheid was the movement of my generation, right? Um, and I saw Bill Clinton on Arsenio Hall. Young people have no idea who Arsenio Hall <laughs> is or was at that time. The only black man, only black person on late night television, and Bill Clinton goes on that show and plays a saxophone. Plays his, wear, and all, wearing, wearing sunglasses. Wearing sunglasses. <laughs> and it was the only show that featured hip hop artists. I'm big, and I grew up with hip hop. So, to me, he did the thing that I needed a candidate to do, which was talk to me, come to me where I'm at, right? And, and I think there is a lack of that in many ways for, with these candidates, and that's become part of the problem, So because they have to be where young people are. But I would say also um, that there's another dynamic that, to me, is underreported. As this country becomes more and more diverse, where we historically do not vote on foreign policy, there's so many first-generation Americans, I'm, I am one, my parents are Jamaican immigrants, that spend a lot of time, particularly with social media, being able to learn about and follow the news of where my family came from. And as that becomes more and more prevalent in this country, we will hold our leaders more accountable for the decisions they make in foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one dynamic that that we're seeing right now that I think both parties have historically taken for granted. We used to see that with Cuban Americans a lot, mm. but now we're seeing it with many more nationalities. You know, um, one of the things that Biden, one of his, you know, when you, when you watch politicians, there's, there's always one line that they repeat constantly again and again. And for Biden, that's don't, com don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And um, I think we're in a time where there's, People, you know, for all the districting that's going on, there's a very negative motivation. I'm more voting against Donald mm -hmm. Trump than I'm necessarily voting for Joe Biden. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, you mentioned voting rights. I mean, the, the Republican goal is to kind of kick out all these people who keep voting the wrong way, you know, just block people from voting. I mean, it's a, it's a, frankly, a... It's a pretty disgraceful aspect of, uh, of uh, what they're doing. But, but, the, but there's a negative motivation that, that you're appealing to. But something to throw into the mix is that, so you're talking about either or. At the local level in New York City, the city has decided to look at a different type of voting for primary elections for city council, which is ranked choice voting. Yes. Which means it's not either or. Right. You could have 10 candidates and you pick your top five. And that gives people so much more flexibility and ability to really, you don't have to be the top one. You could pick your second, third, fourth, or fifth candidate. 
and it all kind of works out that way. Um, so it's, it, it gives people more say, and their votes matter more that way. Will that happen for presidential primaries or federal or state? Uh, who, who knows? Well, but it could because I think the state could organize its own way of, you know, choosing its choosing its delegates. Because technically, you're voting for delegates, not for. Mm -hmm. and, and there's been some controversy over how it was implemented and how well people understand it. And it's you know it's different, so it's a little more. You have to think about it a little bit more, but it, it's gone well. It, it, I think that people will get used to it. We've had these. Jeff, you and I have had these discussions about ranked choice voting and people were absolutely up in arms and nobody's going to figure it out. The mayor himself didn't like it. He they figured opposed. it out. He won. Yeah. He won. They figured yeah. it out. Anyway. You know, and, you know, and um, it also, the other thing that ranked choice voting, it, it disincentivizes you beating up an, a, an, a, an, you know, an opposing candidate mm -hmm. because you want to get their people in. So, so there, the Biden, you know, don't look at the almighty, look at the alternative. It doesn't really make sense. Because there's there's coalitions you build with other candidates, and it's 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 a much more holistic way of the vote of, of going through the voting process. And I think that's an important point when it comes to the youth vote, because again, sometimes it's do we pick our poison, hold our nose, and vote for the candidate that we really don't like, but if we don't want the worst to happen, then so shall it be. Absolutely, versus, that's, that's the choice right, they face. Right. Right. Versus imagining and organizing and trying to build something completely different, which are your more radical left folks, which choose to opt out of the current system, but it's about access and choice, right? And I think that a lot of young voters, because our current structures are really formal and very rigid and oftentimes can be very exclusive and hard to break into, um, folks feel like they are presented a candidate that they did not have an opportunity to really be a part of the decision making of, I think this is the best candidate for this particular district. It was already decided in a county committee meeting, you know, a few months ago. Um, and I think that if we are able to reimagine ways that we can engage in the voting process when it comes to candidate selection, when it comes to who and how and when we can vote, I think that's a very empowering you know, it's process. Also, right, it's also, um, you know, when I went to Brooklyn College, when I started at Brooklyn College, I knew everything. And, um, you know, now I know nothing. You know, I mean, Socrates was the wisest man in the world because he knew that he knew nothing. And you know, one of the things that does not plague young, this isn't grotesque generalization, but I think there's something to it. You know, it, you know doubt doesn't bother you know, a, lot of, a lot of younger voters. And when you get older, you kind of, you know, you, you have battle scars. Mm. And you start to realize that an incremental change it's worth it because it's going to help people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, we grew up, you know, think of, think of the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, some of the labor strength, even though labor has, even though labor unions have been weakened, but there's this sort of a resurrection going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't tell me that the situation is not better for people today because of those movements, even if it's not, you know, mm -hmm. You know, even if it's not the great revolution, that would be that. things are definitely better in many cases. But I tell you, I watch what's happening. I saw what happened on January 6th, and I'm like, how did that happen? Mm. <laughs> right? How 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 did these institutions that we thought would block this, would keep this from happening? How did we let in a president that did a call and response that allowed that to happen? That is the that is so to me. So in many ways, there well, are a lot of things. That's the threat. That's but but that's that's today. It's not yes. the threat. It's the it's the reality. I mean, because even if you know, look, just put on take off my Democratic hat and just put on like just just human being from the Bronx hat, right? Um, even if Trump is not elect reelected or is not elected in 2024. Trumpism is still going to be around. It's like high school chemistry. Energy is never created nor destroyed, mm -hmm. right? So where, do, where does all of that go? It has to go somewhere, mm -hmm. and a lot of it's still in our institutions. That's mm -hmm. what I worry about. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also, you know, there's also a question, does fever break? And um, there's no sign that it's breaking yet. In fact, it's getting more intense on the Republican side. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> have to hope, you know, or else the Republican Party might... If it does not succeed this year, it might seriously start to fade away because that's the extreme nature of, of what we're facing. 
who knows what comes up. I mean, you know, there's, there's no labels party, which seems to be very, very strange. I don't know. If uh, the you... way the two-party system is set up, uh, that if, if they fail, if the Republicans lose badly, then they'll adjust and mm -hmm. be back again in 2026. I mean, that's, yeah. that's just the nature well, of but the, the system. I think. Right. The question is, will they learn? And will they be able, you know, because if they go deeper into the rabbit hole, you know, if you go, you know, if, you know, you look at who controls the House of Representatives and uh, the deeper you go in the rabbit hole, the harder it is to cl the, the harder it is to climb out. So so I don't know if there's a point at which because you have a lot of Republicans, never Trumpers, who are now saying my party is dead. The Michaels, the Michael Steeles of the world. But nothing succeeds like success. Mm -hmm. They all want to win. Yes. And at some point they'll find a way. Yeah. Right. Yes, ma'am. Tell us your name and your campus, please. Hi, my name is Shuruko Barsiki. I go to John Jay College for Criminal Justice. Uh, my question is, in a time where money often dictates political power, how can we ensure that the interests of local communities, especially those who are marginalized, are not sidelined in the political process? You know, you made the point uh, um, that money isn't, you know, money's important, but money's not the big... I happen to think that you know, loyalty is the mother's milk of politics more than, more than, uh, more than money is. But you know, you do see because of Citizens United, which allowed dark money that doesn't have that is not trackable, in immense amounts, to kind of start to flow through. You, you know, politics. You see, um, you know, basically candidates are you know are farming out their campaigns to these in so-called independent PACs. I mean, money, I don't think money's everything, but I think money's a lot. Money's a lot, especially, look, if you're running a, uh, if you're running a campaign where you got to spend a lot of money on, t you need to be on TV or you need to do, and people still do mail, <clears throat> if you need to do mail, all of that, you know, that costs money. Obviously, that's important, but ultimately, you know, you show up at a subway stop in the morning and get to meet voters, people will see you and people will respond to you. You show up at a church on Sunday, mm -hmm. voters will respond to you. You show up, you have to show up. My, my other argument, my sort of complimentary argument to that is as, as a head of, former head of state party, we know if you don't vote. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. We know if you don't vote. We have very sophisticated tools that we can attach to the name of a voter, not just where you, we obviously where you live, but not just your email, phone number, and gender. We get all of this great information about you as a voter based on your internet searches and the apps on your phone. We can model you to a T. So if you don't vote, we know that. If there are groups of you in neighborhoods that don't vote, we know that. And if you're a candidate, speaking of money, with limited time and limited resources, you have to make these very critical decisions about how much time to spend in different places. And if you see, and I'm, this is not me, but I'm just saying any candidate, no matter what the party, if you see that there are chunks of voters that don't regularly come out knowing how, how expensive it is to hold that voter's hand and mm -hmm. get them to come out, you're going to make some critical you know, decisions. It's interesting. Right, but it's also the case that this may sound counterintuitive, but I think campaign money in congressional races is less important in New York, where you have 10 congressional <coughs> districts in the city, than it would be in a place where you have one congressional district, and it's a much higher profile. You know, it's hard to break through the cacophony of your business, my old business. Sure, TV ads matter, I suppose, less in New York City because it's very expensive yeah. and targeted. Uh, I think two things can be true at once. Yes, uh, I guess for a hyper-local example, yes, the mayor, Mayor Eric Adams, was elected uh, with the support of million-dollar donations from some super PACs. At the same time, now that he's mayor, uh, I have personally seen his talking points change directly <laughs> after a question at a town hall. I mean, if enough, mm -hmm. I was just watching a town hall where multiple people asked about e-bikes. Yep. Uh, and the mayor and his team have been just like completely like freaking out about this and responding, trying to make the right e-bike policy when it comes to deliveries, when it comes to the battery fires. Uh, and that's not, that's not something that the big donors care about necessarily. That's something that's really grassroots. It's, it's just the individual constituent. So like, yes, big money is absolutely a factor in electing people in politics, but at the same time, local politics is very responsive to people emailing. You know, um, 
among the other things we saw in 2022 and in 2023 in the local elections is the shifting ethnic alliances within the city. You see a significant rise in Republican voting within the Asian American community in particular. Mm -hmm. And it's for a lot of reasons. It's for crime. It's also for the, you know, pr progressive opposition to the specialized high school admissions test. I mean, it's a lot of various issues that get into play. You see... Um, you see some some significant Republican advance within the Latino community, which I believe is somehow linked to the um, increasing Pentecostal evangelical non-Catholic growth, you know, within the <coughs> Latino community. So, you know, districting, you know, people who are map making are quite aware of that, aren't they? Sure. No, that we, we maybe don't follow the, or attach all of that consumer data to all of this information, but we have a really good sense of how these patterns are shifting. But, you know, I was going to say in terms of how um, local communities can make themselves heard, it really does start in some ways with drawing the district lines because the way the process works, let's say, at the state level, where the legislature ultimately decides, even with this new sort of independent redistricting process, that, you know, they, yes, they'll probably listen to people locally, but when you look at New York City, how the district lines were drawn for the city council, it was a much more engaged, I think, conversation and a much more intense discussion about how local people should be represented. It's not like we'll move this community from one place to another, like a pawn on a chessboard. It's, you know, we really care, and we want you to draw the lines that reflect us and reflect right. our communities. You know, the politics of redistricting, which is always fascinating, um, you know, there's a strong belief, because the, because the Democrats took it on the chin in 2022 in terms of looking, in terms of losing districts, that Hakeem Jeffries, who is the, you know, from Brooklyn, is the Democratic leader in the House of Representatives could be, if some of these seats change, the Speaker of the House. He was the first one out of the box saying, I don't like these lines. And, you know, presumably he's in the business of protecting his, his Democratic incumbents in New York. So, I mean, there's a, I mean, does anybody, has anybody figured out Hakeem's, you know, uh, Jeffrey's role in this? That kind of big footing. And he's got about as big a as there is in politics right now. Part of the problem with how the process works now is that we don't know, and we may never know, because there's no requirement to make all that information public. But, but it should be, because these lines, we have a, a mapping, online mapping project called Redistricting NU, because everyone is impacted by redistricting, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and, uh, but that information isn't publicized, so we may never know whether there is an effort to tip the scales. You know, the legislators will say, no, no one talked to us about this, blah, blah, blah. We have to take them at their word. Maybe yeah, they but, did, maybe they didn't. You know, but, the, but you know, even the questions about uh, uh, Jeffrey's involvement in this underlines the national implications well, of what happens in New York. Well, what is it? There are 18 <clears throat> congressional districts across the country that Biden won currently represented by Republicans. Six of them are in New York. Mm -hmm. So we just got one back, right? So, yeah, it's the difference between him being the first black speaker or not. And he clearly has, you know, got a lot at stake here. And you alluded to this before. I mean, when does New York play this heavily in national politics, right? Unless right. we actually put up our own candidate. Mm -hmm. um, we are... I think, obviously, we're a solidly blue state six times since the Great Depression have we voted for a Republican. So um, we are we are uh, a big sort of pocketbook, a bank account for, for candidates. But in this year, with these congressional elections, so much um, is, 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 is going to run through New York and California. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what's your sense of, uh, you know, that's the degree to which the redistricting process was, in fact, nationalized. When you see, I'm assuming that, you know, since Congressman Jeffries publicly said, I don't like these lines that mm -hmm. came out of the Independent Commission, that he was more involved in that. He's a very hands-on, very smart guy. I was trying to find out how much involvement he had. <laughs> uh, very hard. And, you know, his team said, no, there was no talking, no back-channeling. I'm sure there was some, you know, somehow... 
<laughs> people seem to know what it, what Jeffries wants, and that's true. Of yeah, but but um, Basil's making the point that you know Democratic hopes coming through New York is kind of unique because you know because we are a one party state. Oh, there's a lot and of that's pressure. why I keep yeah. coming back to the question of for all the discussion about lines. I believe what happened in 2022 was not the lines. I think if the, you could have drawn all kinds of lines, but it was a messaging mm. that drove that election. Mm. That, um, you know, and I am not technically capable of saying if you, you know, if you redid this in this structure that you, it was a messaging wipeout that happened, you know, relative wipeout that happened. To, so, I mean, are we too obsessed with lines? Well, I mean, a, it's your as business. A, as so. a map maker. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I would, whenever I would talk to the press about this, I would always try to emphasize that, you know, the horse race stuff, maybe it doesn't matter as much like you're suggesting. You really need to, like uh, the, the decision that just happened in the new congressional lines in District 16, represented by Jamal Bowman, where Co-op City, it wasn't moved, but the line was redrawn so that they're now yeah. again in District 16. They used to be in District 14 this past cycle. They were in, they were in um, Ocasio-Cortez's right. district. And, and in the they, past, they've been But that in has district an implication 16. in the Democratic primary, but the, because it, as opposed to necessarily in a general election where that but, district is more likely to be Democrat, who, whether Bowman wins or the George Lenimer but wins. But the attention on it was, like I was saying, they're a chess piece. And co-op city is being moved around, and the lines are being redrawn. Well, what do people co-op in co-op city think? <laughs> what is you know? Do they like being in a district that includes part of Queens? Do they want to be in a district that's part of Westchester? Maybe they do, but the focus is not on them. And they're going to have to live. We all are going to have to live with these lines, regardless of who's in office for the next maybe not ten years because it's been so chaotic these past couple of years, but for a good number of years mm. going forward. So in some ways, we matter, the, the, the voters, more yeah. than the elected officials mm. and the red-blue debate. Yes, sir. Tell me, tell us your name and your campus. My name is uh, Major Nanla, and I'm from Queens College. My question is, uh, since nowadays a lot of young voters get their uh, media from either Twitter or mainline uh, sources like CNN and whatnot about national stuff, how do you think that would affect come local stuff? For well, the role of social media in, um, you know, this is where I am highly not competent to discuss, <laughs> but, the, but the role of social media creating, you know, I believe that as, tech, as technology fragmented the media, everybody's receded to their ideological silos and it's, and it's been destructive of finding a common ground, but that's how people get their information today. It is, um, and I always encourage um, folks to be critical consumers of information and uh, diversify your reading list, right? I am very intentional about reading um, outlets that um, you know, I fundamentally with. disagree with, right. um, but need to understand their arguments, um, who is saying what, why, what is their rationale, um, to either challenge you know, my own position to reaffirm why I was you know, in, in the position that I, that I had to begin with. Um, I also think it's important just to acknowledge um, the importance of local media and local journalism. Um, without going too deep into the weeds, there's been a lot of loss in coverage of what's happening locally in neighborhoods um, as, as an industry. Um, and I am concerned about what the impact has on, you know, not just voters, but particularly younger voters who are new to the process of exploring media outlets and, you know, consuming news and being intentional about thinking about what the issues are and how they're presented if we do not have um, a, f a field to, to write about it. Um, and so then you are parsing out, you know, what local issues to folks who are not of the community, which is a really wrong approach in terms of really having a nuanced understanding what the issues are and to whom. Mm -hmm. good. I think uh, it's a good question because I think races are in part more nationalized because of that. Uh, because more people are getting their news from, right, CNN or, or the New York Times or, or just Twitter, where you can get news from all over the world and all over the country. Um, there are some benefits to that. I mean, I, frank, I think that uh, Congress members uh, vote on national issues is obviously very important, and they should be held accountable on that and not just the potholes, uh, but it, there's certainly a change. If I just, if I just add very quickly, it actually goes to your point about local elections. It makes it harder for the candidates with little money mm. to influence the the um, 
the the wave of information that however, a person would get. However, the fragmentation and the and the silos also could be used as an organizing tool at the, I mean, same, it, at the same time. It's it small d democratizes mobilization. It definitely right. does weird, that. You know, in a weird way. And I'll just right. say very quickly, I was speaking upstate New York one day, had four hours to kill. What do you do when you have four hours to kill in Ithaca, New York? You get a tattoo. So I was getting a tattoo. <laughs> and I always ask people this, like, where do you get your news? And he said, YouTube. And it becomes really difficult if you want to create a counter narrative to whatever that person is getting. It becomes difficult to kind of intersect that. Mm -hmm. uh, because A, you have to know where that person is. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have the resources to create the content to do that. So that, th it's sort of a, it's a, it's a very difficult game of like of a cat and mouse to try to try to really narrow down how you create that counter narrative and with whom. Yes, ma'am, tell us your name and your campus, please. My name is Shauna and my campus is John Jay College for Community Justice. Um, the question that I have is, when it comes to the primary elections and getting voters to come out, especially youthful voters and um, uh, people who usually don't vote, what is what do you think is going to appeal to them to choose Republican or Democrat? Because do they have ideals um, that on issues that they usually you know focus on to get um, people to choose a party? Because I know that they cannot vote in the primary elections without choosing a party. So what do you think that a candidate should do in order to get um, them You're to elected. <laughs> um, as an elected, you have to identify your base and then expand your base if you, if you want to win. Um, and so I think, particularly when it comes to youth, as you're figuring out, you know, what issues are most important, you know, to, to you as a person, to your family, to your community. Um, the conversations I've had um, with, with colleagues and, and, and younger folks has been, um, listen, no party may be perfect, but where do you want to go? Where do you want to go, you know, as, as a society, as, as a community, however you choose to define that? Um, and then think of the parties as a bus, which, which bus route is going to get you closest to where you're trying you know, to go. Right, you know, and also, uh, you know, as I'm, I want to go to, to uh, one last question, but as I'm, you know, bemoaning people trying to sit out at the same time, um, trying to decide which party, you know, historically parties start very small, you know, so I mean, you can't create a new reality. You know, it's, it's very tough because we have this duopoly, this Democratic-Republican duopoly. I mean, there's a lot of room within them. There used to be very liberal Republicans and very conservative Democrats. Now they're polarized, which I think is a reflection of the, of the technological changes that have sent us. So, you know, but there is, you know, there is a longer view. And then there's the immediate choice that you have to make. Let me take one, one last question. Uh, Sun Woo Kim, and I'm currently attending the City College of New York. And Professor Smickle, I know you mentioned candidates knowing who votes even on a local level and the possibility of that candidates could skip outreach to areas not expected to show up on election day. What could that translate into for those areas after the election? Would they be ignored or receive less services? But yes to both. Yeah. Uh, that's the challenge, right? Yeah. We want You want to get people out to vote because if... You know, if you are, we are a city of renters, right? Not not owners. But where is where does the the sort of locus of political agency reside among a lot of areas where you have a lot of owners and high income high income earners? Um, and so, if you if you don't, and if for one that doesn't agree with that, go look at challenges with the public housing uh, across our city to this day. Mm -hmm. So the, so yes, the if you if a candidate is counting on certain constituencies not coming out. All of the policy they create is going to exclude those communities, intentionally so, until, unless and until, there is something that brings that person and says, you either, you either come and pay attention to us, or it's going to be a threat threatening to your political future. Mm -hmm. And there have been opportunities where, where we've seen that happen. Uh, and, and by the way, it, I will tie it to a, a point from earlier when you talked about the Asian American community. When I started in this business 20 years ago, um, the Asian American community would never have had, did not have the power to push back the black community on an, issue, of, on an issue of the specialized high schools. Mm -hmm. 
But with members of Congress, city council members, state assembly, state senate members, there's a political and economic power that that community has that now they have the opportunity to force change in a way that they didn't even 10 years ago. And so now p people are like, we got to go there, right? And that's, and as a person from a Jamaican community, same thing, you know, my community had the same issue at some point in, in, in the past. Well, you know, it's so we all, so we, so we do that, right? Like it, you, you don't want to talk to us now, but you will. Mm -hmm. And you know, what's going to happen? How is that going to You know, happen? again, that level of complexity, just yeah. as in 1990, Puerto Ricans were mm -hmm. less than 50 percent of the Latino population, meaning immigration moved up. The, you know, when I was a kid, uh, blacks meant American blacks. Right. That's Latinos right. met meant um, Puerto Ricans. Puerto Rican, yeah. You know, and white people were everything from, you know, Italians and Irish and Jews and stuff like that. And there was a very small pockets of mainly Chinese, when we talk about Asian Americans, it was mainly, it was, you know, it was mainly Chinese. It's a much more complicated That's right. That's right. city. I think it's a, I think it's a huge plus that we're that much more complicated. I think it's a much more interesting city, mm -hmm. but it's politically, but you know, navigating it politically is much tougher. Well, the, the candidate that recognizes that complexity, because you even said it yourself, that the white community was all of these different ethnicities, but it was Chinese and it was Puerto Rican. It actually wasn't always that. There was still, there was still, you know, there's still complexity to all these communities of color um, in these so-called minority communities. But because um, my parents have been here since 1970, so right. you know what I mean. So, so the point but being now that you have as all these African immigrants, now you have, you know, you know, within the black community, that's right. Have this that's right. Huge so there's no, so there isn't, a, and that's the key. There is no block. Is there is no monolith that's right. of any. Yeah. Everybody's a minority, in a and sense. and that ha well, <laughs> and and that's why we see the problems nationally, right? Because of this <laughs> growing uh, minority uh, population, right? Um, but that said, you know, it it is. The candidate that recognizes the complexity and speaks to that complexity, campaigns to that complexity and those nuances is the candidate that's going to win. Mm -hmm. I think it's a beautiful thing about New York, right? I mean, the, 20 years ago, there was like one Dominican politician in the city. Mm -hmm. And then as the Dominican population has grown and as more Dominicans have become citizens that can vote, now there's, I don't know, more than a dozen in the city. Right? And the reality is that that first Dominican politician was Guillermo Linares, who was elected to mm -hmm. the assembly. And he was opposed by a lot of Puerto Rican powers, the power structure mm -hmm. that wasn't ready to, in their mind, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. give up the power. I mean, you had the, you know, you had the same thing um, in, the, you know, in, in one of the mayoral elections where um, I think it was Denny Farrell was put up to keep a Latino candidate from winning the mayoral that, nomination. He was put up at the last time. Is that Herman Bedio? I think was that it Herman was Bedio was day? poised to win, so. you know, a primary. And, you know, and I think the world of Denny Farrell, we miss him immensely. Um, but, you know, there was kind of, you know, kind of crass racial politics, if you will, which is much harder to do today. So, I mean, you know, it's, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you look at the numbers. It's a much, you know, demographically... We're all over the map, yeah. literally. The coalition approach is absolutely mm -hmm. essential. You can't just win with one group or another. Mm -hmm. We literally we're well, all you can in certain neighborhoods. You yeah, can in certain right. neighborhoods. Well, I guess I'm thinking of like right. You can on a campaign. district level, right? And, or even a congressional campaign, which is they're big, the districts, so they mm -hmm. help us a lot. Of and I wonder about that. This is something that always preoccupies me because I can't. I got politically active because I saw. Uh, Jesse Jackson on TV in 88 saying the party's not being responsive to people that look like me, mm -hmm. which meant me. And then David Dinkins wins in 89. So I wonder if, if the Democrats have leaned too long on that older coalition and haven't figured out a way to, 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 to has it, ha, they haven't changed it. Um, and which is why may, we may be having the problems that we have on occasion. I, wa I actually wonder about that a lot. And to that point, I think descriptive representation, you know, yeah. race has been a very old, traditional, tried and true organizing tool politically. Um, but for younger folks, descriptive representation doesn't hold the weight that That's maybe true. it does for older generations. And they're more interested um, in ideology of a candidate more so than do well, they. Well, I think it's also because work. younger people are growing up in a much more integrated mm much more integrated world mm -hmm. you know you know I mean you know I was I grew up in the projects I grew up, you know I grew up in I grew up in Linden houses in East New York and that was mm -hmm. that was integrated but that was unusual 
And so, you know, you uh, did have neighborhoods that were, you know, that were very unipolar for one of them. I don't know what the right, I don't know what the right word is. We have about 30 seconds left. I'm since you are the senior pundit. <laughs> you know, I mean. Speaking of age. <laughs> no, no, I'm a thumb. <laughs> um, in about, you know, in about 10 seconds. Are we in good shape going forward? I mean, that, you know, it's. I'm still concerned about the overt and covert effects of uh, race in race in this country. Mm. Um, very quickly, I, you know, I, I look at someone like Yusuf Salam, who's a city council member now. I remember that time in history. I, we're the same age, so I remember how it felt to be a young black man right. in that space and time. I still don't go to Central Park today. Mm. Have never been in a Central. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm I'm over time, which oh. puts me in trouble with CUNY. I try to make that line. Thank you. We'll see you next time on CUNY Forum. <laughs>